Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. This episode has a slightly different setup from what you may be used to when listening to Foodie Pharmacology. This interview is part of a series that I did in collaboration with the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. In this series, I talk to different experts about the trends they observe in plants that are important to our agriculture, diets, and health. I hope you enjoy. Where all this comes together, I think, is in the plant treaty itself. In the plant treaty and in the negotiations at the international level, all this information uh, would be helpful to be known to be able to understand where these crops are at, uh, how much countries um, need them or want to work together in a multilateral way to conserve them and trade them, um, and how we should devote international resources towards various different crops. Hello, this is Dr. Cassandra Quave presenting Treaty Talks, a podcast by the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. In this series, I'm discussing trends with experts in crop production, research, and gastronomy. This series reflects on plants that feed the world, a study and database presenting figures on plants that are important to humans' diet, health, and livelihoods on a global scale. My name is Colin Corey, and I'm a crop diversity researcher. I have worked at various scales from local, national, and international as a farmer, as a seeds person, and as a genetic resources professional in seed banks. I've collaborated previously with the Plant Treaty and the Crop Trust on issues and questions around countries' interdependence regarding plant genetic resources, and also on major trends change over time in crop diversity, including both the loss of that diversity as well as increasing homogeneity in global food supplies. I led this crop indicator study, the scientific analysis of how we can put together vast amounts of information from many different sources to try to understand uh, the current status of crops and their genetic resources. I did that in collaboration with a number of organizations, particularly international organizations in the CGIAR and at the Global Crop Diversity Trust and in collaboration with the Plant Treaty. So can you tell us a little bit more about what this study is about? Absolutely. <laughs> this study is an ambitious approach to trying to put together many different types of information about crops, about what their uses are around the world, where and how they're produced, traded, consumed, but also about their genetic resources, their diversity. That is, how well conserved they are in seed banks or gene banks and botanic gardens and other places how well those resources are backed up in locations like the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, and also very much how much those seeds or other types of germplasm are traded and exchanged across the world. The idea is to get the big holistic picture of how our crops doing uh, and the pipeline of their development, their future resilience and productivity. What are, what are they... Um, how much are they used in the current, uh, and where are they headed? Where all this comes together, I think, is in the plant treaty itself. In the plant treaty and in the negotiations at the international level, all this information uh, would be helpful to be known to be able to understand where these crops are at, uh, how much countries um, need them or want to work together in a multilateral way to conserve them and trade them, um, and how we should devote international resources towards various different crops. That's great. Well, can you give us some examples of the types of data that are found in this report and how one would access that data? There is a lot of information around the world about crops, about how they're grown, um, how they're consumed, how they're conserved. But we were looking in particular for information that was well curated, high quality, and repeatable. Therefore, uh, we could go back to those sources, say, in five or 10 years and learn how much it's changed over time uh, and have confidence in that information. And so ultimately what we found was that there was perhaps 300, 350 or so crops around the world 
that we thought had adequate information to be able to build this vast global resource uh, about all of these different aspects of the crop. That is both quite a lot of crops and it's also just the beginning. There are many, many more crops around the world that frankly just don't have much information that's recorded and well available. And so we well recognize that this is a great start based on the majority of crops that are um, very much eaten and very much produced around the world. And then there are many, many thousands that remain to investigate and build more information about. So once we started to understand the number of crops that we were able to find information on, we started to look at various sources of information. And those ended up in five major areas or domains as we call them. The first one is the use of those crops. And that is how much are they produced and where and by whom, how much are they traded, how much are they consumed? And also some other metrics around uh, research, how many research publications are there for each of those crops? And also how much public online interest, for instance, on Wikipedia pages and other social in, uh, information sources. So that together in its first domain was a sense of how much interest are there in these crops, how much use is there. Our second area was about interdependence on genetic resources for these crops. And that question is centrally, how much do people need one another? How much do countries or regions of the world need one another in order to obtain the diversity in those crops that they uh, will need to plant, uh, to breed plants? And the idea or, um, and the science beside, and the science behind understanding interdependence was to look at where crops originally come from and then how much they are needed. That is how much they're produced or consumed in other parts of the world. And the idea is that if a crop is really produced and consumed all over the world, even though it only comes from one place, there's tremendous amount of interdependence around the world, um, um, for that crop and those genetic resources, and perhaps in particular dependence on the regions of origin uh, by other parts of the world. And so uh, to take a crop like, well, vanilla, a spice, uh, one of the most important ones that comes from Mesoamerica originally and is grown widely in other places like Madagascar. And the idea is that there would be uh, interdependence around the world um, because many regions, well, Madagascar, but many other regions do produce that crop and would need genetic diversity from Mesoamerica in the long term to be able to have the resilience and long-term genetic diversity that they would need. So that's the second domain that we looked at. Um, <clears throat> the third area that we were interested in was the supply of the genetic resources of each crop. And that in essence is how much it, are the, is this crop diversity conserved in seed banks, in botanic gardens, uh, and in other locations. We also looked at the information or the data that's really needed to use those genetic resources. And so we asked uh, how many, for instance, herbarium voucher resources are there in herbaria around the world for those crops, or how many uh, digital sequence information or genomic sequence data are there for each of those crops. So that ends up in the supply domain of this mega study on uh, crops and their use and their genetic resources. The uh, uh, fourth area is about the security of those genetic resources. And that one simply asks, how much are the resources that are held in seed banks or botanic gardens or other locations backed up in long-term facilities like the Svalbard Global Seed Vault? And the fifth and final area is around demand for these genetic resources. And that relates to a variety of metrics to understand how much do seeds and other property goals of these crops get traded and exchanged. And that information comes from sources like the plant treaty itself and its data store on the transfer of standard material transfer agreements, the FAO's views database in which countries report how much germplasm is exchanged out of national seed banks. Also from the UPAV, um, the International Union for the Protection of Varieties and the UPAV resource, which relates to registered commercial varieties around the world and other ways of understanding how much crops are being developed, how much germplasm is being exchanged. 
That's amazing. I mean, this is such a tremendous project and you're you're hitting on so many metrics. I mean, one thing that I'm hearing is as you go through these these five major areas of of data collection is that this really serves as a as a as a check for where we are today. But is it true that this may also be used, this data could be used to predict needs going into the future? We're facing a lot of challenges. Um, for our crops due to issues related to climate change, to crop pests and pathogens. Um, could these tools be used to predict how to best be prepared for the for these kind of supply challenges we may face in the future? I think so. I think that we can use this information to understand uh, the near-term issues around the crops. For instance, there are a set of crops that can be seen to be pretty important around the world and often growing in importance and yet have very little genetic resources available currently. And uh, with further information or further research, one can understand that the major production around the world is based on limited genetic diversity. And so through this study, a number of crops could be identified that if we want to think about bulking up or diversifying that genetic diversity, that could be a great use of of time and interest in the next 10 years. Right now, this information in 2023, we hope will be uh, useful for a variety of different researchers, academics, uh, political spheres, and other areas. In the plant treaty, this information provides resources on many, many crops, well over the number of crops currently listed in the multilateral system of the plant treaty. And it's Annex 1. And so if the plant treaty is interested in discussing the potential expansion of the scope of that multilateral system, our hope is that this information source will provide evidence, will provide a place by which to really discuss those crops and understand their current status. Another use of this crop indicator and how we built it in a way in which the data is standardized and draws upon information that is curated and well taken care of is that we can potentially go back ourselves or researchers in the future, 10 years, uh, 15 years, 20 years from now, or in shorter time frames, and understand how much the status of each of these crops has changed over time. It's already really evident in the last 20 years that many crops are changing. Their status, their production, their, um, their issues and pests and diseases and such. And uh, we believe that this study will be useful to return to five years, 10 years, 15 years in the future and understand, are we doing what we need to do in terms of conservation or exchange to keep on top of the challenges as they change and grow because of climate change, because of increasing demand, because of other consumer needs, et cetera. If you had to name just two major outcomes from the study, what would those be? The first would be that there is a vast amount of crop diversity around the world which may sound like a simple sentence, but put into real information and real data and understanding that while it is true that there is a limited set of crops that we all depend on majorly, wheat and maize and rice and potatoes and a set of others, it is also true that there is a very long list of crops that we also depend on tremendously. And that includes many crops that we just don't tend to think of in those ways as much, like onions and tomatoes in the vegetable category, or many spices which we actually eat every day. And so this information resource puts some data on that, puts some teeth to that understanding that actually there's a tremendous amount of diversity around the world that we're using and um, and likely going to become ever more interconnected and interdependent on those uses. The second major finding of the study is that crops are always changing. And it's evident that uh, the crops that are coming up in the world right now that are growing vastly in terms of the number of producers or the number of countries weren't on the radar even a couple of decades ago. And so This is a resource that understands 10,000 more years of human history and plants that we've worked with directly and invested a lot of time in, um, in totality. 
it also is a way of understanding which ones are becoming even more important as we increasingly globalize. And there are, of course, crops like quinoa that we've heard about and know about. They're growing and are in over 100 countries now. There are also quite a lot of other crops that are evident in this study that are also on that same trend and will probably be spoken about like quinoa in another five or 10 years. This resource is interesting and surprising, I think, in the sense that uh, examining each of the different metrics really gives a different insight on where the world is in terms of our interest in crops, where we think we should be devoting our resources, um, and how we're collaborating and exchanging those resources around the world. One of the surprises I also had with this research was understanding that there is a wide variation in the conservation status and the status of other important resources for crops, for instance, in digital sequence information. There's quite a lot of information for a few crops and major gaps for many other crops, even crops that are really important. One other really important note with this information, while the data can be used to compare crops and know, for instance, how much one is produced compared to another, it is important to remember that every one of these crops is really important to many people around the world. They're all widely used. They're all important to a lot of folks and they all deserve appreciation and attention. So Colin, can you give us a sense of scale? How many, how many plants are cultivated by humans across the globe and how many of those actually feed most of the world? There is a tremendous diversity of plants around the world, hundreds of thousands of species. And we know that many thousands, perhaps seven or 10,000, have been used or cultivated by people over time. And so it's remarkable that we boil way down to just a couple hundred of species in which we really know a lot about their production and consumption, and we consider them to be uh, globally important. That is true. It is a couple of hundred that we provide uh, most of our calories and other um, ways of, of seeing the fundamental needs of humanity on. But it is also true that there are many hundreds and thousands of other plants out there that contribute in some way, in other ways, in um, uh, to our to our needs, to our sustenance, to our uh, cultures. What would you recommend as a next step, or where do you see future opportunities in this field? My hope is that the next step with this resource is to really use it. That is, for uh, the plant treaty and other areas in which international negotiations should be happening around crops, that this resource is, is, is investigated and used and interrogated and, and understood for all of the different reasons of improving uh, the way that, that parties, that countries work together. My hope is that also this is a starting point for various other areas of investigation. Academic researchers may be very interested in some of these different metrics and how they can investigate further and prove them it also, as a study, is uh, it also as a study has revealed that while we have a lot of information around the world, in many cases that information still isn't very organized, um, uh, consistently reported, and well funded in the sense of uh, long term repositories of information really necessary to to the world's food security, and so. My hope is that this study will also help to identify the areas in which we need to devote more attention to the statistics, to the data, to the information we need on production and consumption on this vast list of other crops out there that we know very little about uh, so that in the future, we'll have more information, more ability to understand and predict the future to discuss how we need to work well together. It's such an exciting study. I mean, so really important. So great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Treaty Talks, a podcast by the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. For more interviews and information, visit www.fao.org slash plant dash treaty.
Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. To listen to this and other episodes of the Foodie Pharmacology podcast, head over to foodiepharmacology.com. You'll find links to everything there, including some fun merch. We've also got links to our Teach Ethnobotany YouTube channel, where you can find full video versions of the show. Thanks so much to our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth of Co-Conspiracy Entertainment for putting on a great show for you each and every week. And thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.